2024 Rock Hall Olympic Triathlon brought to you by Kinetic Multisports. Let's dive in. This is our landing page again. We are talking about the Olympic, which is happening on June the 1st. Our sprint is happening on the 2nd. So let's dive into a couple different things. Highly recommend that you read a lot of this stuff here, and we're going to be rolling through a ton of it here. So first option here, we have two options for packet pickup. One is Friday 5 to 7, located at the race site. The second is uh or, and there's a pre-race meeting 6 p.m um i don't know if they're going to be doing a facebook live version of this um but again this isn't recommended or not re this isn't required that you have to attend this um if they do a facebook live it's a great opportunity for you to just hop on they usually post their water temperatures the day before um so everyone knows to bring a wetsuit or not uh, they list the race address right here and the second option for packet pickup is sunday 6 to 7 30 at the race site uh, and again, two options for the sprint as well. Um, there's also novice athletes that have a couple of different links for you to click on. Um, but we're going to dive into some of the details here, hitting the, the athlete guide here. So our athlete guide, this pretty much stays the same every single year, which is why we're doing this ahead of time. Uh, so our schedule of events for the Olympic distance is that 5 to 7 packet pickup, and there is a 6 p.m. race briefing that we talked about. Arrival time on race morning, they require you or highly suggest that you don't arrive later than 7 a.m. because transition opens at 6 a.m. And packet pickup, body mark, and chip pickup all are finished, done, and dusted at 7.30 a.m. 7.40 swimmers are to walk to the start, which is about a quarter mile walk from the transition uh it's a little bit of a rocky start so again if it's a little bit cooler out there on race morning it's going to be a little tougher to hit up the swim area uh in a uh in a rapid fashion uh 740 swimmers walk to the swim start 745 transition area closes no exceptions pre-race briefings at the swim start 745 and our 8 a.m start time is for our olympic distance that is a time trial start this is the dock right here you jump off the dock in groups of three five whatever they um, suggest groups of five go uh, and you're off and there will be a timing mat right at the end there so once you cross that timing mat your time has started uh, that is the sprint which we are not doing so we don't need to worry about that so this is our swim start which is located over here this is our swim finish so you start and finish in two different areas over here you swim around the harbor two times when you exit over here into our transition area which is right here that's why there's no parking uh, the the best place to park is right over here. There is a parking, not a parking lot, but a grass field for you to park in over here. Um, <clears throat> I believe there's overflow parking located uh, at some of these other places, but you likely won't need it there. Oh, right here, yeah, elementary school at West Sharp. And the third one is the Civic Center on Civic Center Road. It's way over here. Uh, scrolling down over here, packet pickup athlete requires you to bring your photo ID, bring your questions. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if you're a minor, you definitely have to have a, a guardian pick up the thing, uh, pick up your packet with you. Um, Ten things to know about race day on page six. Make sure you read that. This is a USAT uh, Triathlon Maryland State Championship race on page seven. Tells you all about that. Uh, course cutoff times for our Olympic distance. The swim is one hour, the bike is three, and the run is a four-hour finish. Uh, transition area info located on page nine. Uh, you are going to be able to enter and exit the transition area during packet pickup, but once it's closed, it is closed. Only way you're entering that is if you swim, finish the swim, bike, or run afterwards. All bikes must be racked and prep completed 15 minutes before the start of the first swimmer, uh, and there is no overnight racking. So only on race morning uh the bike racking again is going to be a first come first serve basis with a 10 foot section of bike racks holding six bikes three per side three are going to be facing one way three are going to be facing the other way and they are going to be staggered um page 10 talks about your race numbers that's your bib that you wear on your run you can use a belt or safety pin it to your shirt you can use a sticker uh the one that they provide for your helmet right here also your bike frame sticker left uh, ankle timing chip uh, will be received when you do check in as well you will be body marked at this race this is a body marked race uh, i actually like that i think that more races should go back to that uh, that's personal uh, personal opinion here. Aid stations on the bike are none on the run. They're going to be every mile, mile and a half apart and are going to have water and Gatorade endurance. Uh, results are going to be posted live. So once 
uh, an athlete crosses the finish line, it will be automatically uploaded to our results tent uh, that is there on race day. Very, very cool stuff for you. Uh, and you can just sit there and uh, watch the results stroll in if you want. USAT roles and rules and penalties are located on page 12. Highly, highly, highly encourage you to read this page. There are hyperlinks here uh, for USAT rules, commonly violated rules like drafting, littering, all of that good stuff, uh, blocking. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, please read them. Um, it just allows you to, to get a better understanding of what happens on race day and what to do should you do get a penalty on race day. All right. Um, <clears throat> page 13 lists our wetsuit rules. Wetsuits uh, for 70 degrees or below are allowed 78.1 to 83.9. You can wear a wetsuit, uh, but you're not going to be eligible for awards. 84 degrees and over for our water temperature, wetsuits are not allowed. Uh, water temperature is going to be taken on race morning. There's also they usually do is take the water temperature the night before. So if you see that our water temperature is 88 degrees the day before your race, you're likely not going to be able to wear your wetsuit if you want to be eligible for awards. You don't need to bring it. And they usually post it on their Facebook group. Uh, page 16 talks about the swim. This is a point-to-point 1.7 uh, five loop swim course over there. Uh, it's a time trial start two athletes every two to three seconds because you're jumping off the dock. There is a 200 meter run back to transition. So this is going to be a little bit longer than some people are used to. Shoes may be staggered along the swim exit path. There are not going to be any wetsuit strippers. No wetsuit strippers here, unfortunately. Um, water safety uh, does not make up for a lack of training in the open water, okay? Uh, on the bike here, a bike course is mapped out, which we will be diving in through. Uh, let's dive into some of the uh, some of the disciplines here. So our swim, uh, this is our transition area located over here. Our swim start, you have to walk down and over and around to get to our swim start, which is located right here. That's why they encourage you to be out of transition ahead of time uh, and just be ready to rock, okay? Our swim start is gonna take you around this area, and this is what they mean by the 1.75. We do once, and then we go once, twice, and then straight in. On this straight in, uh, if it's a sunny day or a partly cloudy day, you will uh, be blinded by the sun going back into uh, your swim finish okay if it's a cloudy day it's going to be great what they normally do is put a giant wiggly man or something uh, at our swim finish site where that dock is located ask what is going to be there when you are checking in on race morning okay uh, but for this first section, after you jump in here, we are jumping in in groups of twos, uh, but for whatever reason, this does get very bunched up, almost always, uh, and that's down to the fact that there, there's an inlet right through here, and what that means is the water uh, will either spin around this way, or it will spin around that way. Uh, and you'll be able to see it on race morning. Um, things will be floating along. You'll be able to say, okay, if the water is getting blown this way, right? you're going to have to aim for this sighting buoy here just to get to that turn buoy right through there. Very, very common for athletes to drift really far to the right on this swim start. Um, if the water is doing that, if it's doing the other opposite way, obviously you're going to reverse what I just said. Um, but once you start to get past this section over here, it does start to thin out a bit over here. This is especially true on this straightaway for the first time, all right? Uh, fast or mid-pack athletes are going to be uh, kind of happy days right through here. It might get a little bit lonely right through here, all right? If you've started in a pack that's a little too fast for you on this long stretch section here, uh, you're probably going to get gobbled up by the people coming up from behind you, all right? This section that we are only going to be doing once over here, we turn left. Don't be surprised if you do hit a little sand barge in there. Um, and if you are starting later on in the pack or you arrive at the swim start a little bit later, you'll be able to see athletes stand up uh, sometimes over here. So don't, uh, don't freak out if you see the bottom or touch sand right there. Very, very normal for that to happen. Probably uh, in this section right through here. And it moves from year to year, so it's not always in the same spot. Might not even be there. Um, but it's not uncommon for it to be there is what I'm trying to say. 
Starting off on our second loop now, this is where things kind of get a little more serious. This section right through here, uh, this is kind of our go section for our Olympic athletes on the second uh, loop here. Uh, and that continues pretty much until you get right to about here. Fool's errand is to continue that and all the way into that finish uh, dock over there. You want to get to the dock, but you don't want to overly exert yourself to get to the dock. All right. Um, so after you get past uh, right through this section here, after you get past here, this is your opportunity to start ticking the box and saying, hey, I have a long transition run. What do I need to be doing in transition? How can I get there faster? What's going to allow me to, to progress down the dock a little bit easier? Once you get out to our dock over here, we have a long run up to the transition over there. What that means for you is a couple of different things. The dock, uh, watch out for nails sticking up. Might want to walk this before the, the race starts, you know, just so you're aware of things on race day. Watch for boards that are sticking up. Usually one person falls on the dock every single year. And it's just because the boards aren't perfectly even, you know, you got a lot of adrenaline. It's no one's fault. You just kind of... you. You just fall over. You're not paying attention as much as you should. And that's our swim, our bike. Uh, okay, so let's dive into our bike. This is our, I'm going to take the speed away cause just because it's a little bit uh, ridiculous over there. This is our um, this is our ride over here, and you can see this is the profile, with, which it happens. Um, <clears throat> and that's the same that matches up with the uh, the blue over here. Our elevation you can see that from the from the elevation standpoint this is not a challenging race what makes this a little bit more challenging is the wind and also the other people so what i mean by that is let's zoom in a little bit here all right so this is coming out of our of our transition right through here all right uh, of course, what everyone wants to do is they want to hit the bike. They want to fly during this section over here and just get out of town. Uh, but what they will not tell you is these two turns right here, this right turn and then this left turn to get out of the main road. Those are probably one of the harder turns on course. You're going a little bit faster here. This right hand turn is a little bit sharper than 90 degrees. Uh, and this is going to normally be the place where wind starts to play a bit of a factor over here, especially on this second left hand turn, which you will be going through the main intersection there. Uh, which is also kind of nerve wracking a little bit. There'll be, I mean, there's usually police officers and personnel stopping the traffic over there. Um, if you are one of the first people, just, you know, maybe don't crush those two corners, okay? And after you, uh, you get out of there, then things become a little more challenging for different reasons over here. This first stretch of road right here, it's gonna, it's gonna feel like it's a lot longer than it is. Uh, and that's because you can really see out far in front of you, all right? You'll be able to, to start, start to put the power down. And most times you're going to have a headwind during this section. On this little chicane over here, you can get a little reprieve from that wind. Um, and it might turn into a tailwind or a cross tailwind for you over there. It just depends on uh, race day conditions. And I don't have the answers for you. Uh, right off the top of my head because it will change from a year-to-year -year basis all right going back up over here once you make this left-hand turn it slowly starts to undulate back through this section over here and up till the top turn over there but before we get to that top turn this is almost always a section where people overdo on uh, on race day very uh not challenging not uncommon to overdo uh, an Olympic, right? But this is almost always the case where people overdo it right through there. Uh, you will make a right hand bend. And again, uh, it could help you out. It could hurt you depending on the wind, but you just need to be mindful of it. Watch what's happening with people in front of you. If they're getting pushed from the right hand side, make sure you're stabilizing with that opposite left arm. If you uh, are needing to fuel and you see that exact same scenario happening, the wind's coming from your right hand side make sure you're stabilizing with that left hand okay very very crucial for a course like this and then uh the course changes up a bit uh we have kind of our turns mixed in through here most times what will happen on this section right through here is you will experience a tailwind and again that might not sound uh sound right because i just told you on this section you're going to have a, a tailwind and potentially on this one uh the wind out here has a habit of twirling and swirling and switching around out here 
Um, but most times you will have a tailwind over here. And if you if you've noticed that arrow goes this way, but what people want it to do is shift down on this back side of our bike course here, um, and they'll they'll beg and plead and really really drive the pace right through there, no matter what, because they just had a little bit of a tailwind right through here. So they'll say, I absolutely need to have it during this section, and it becomes a crosswind the further you get down on the bottom of our course. Um, be careful that you're not just chasing the watts just to chase the watts, okay? Um, uh, just because it is a tailwind at the top of the course doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be a tailwind at the bottom of our course. Expect the wind to swirl. Expect it, expect it, expect it. Um, if it is a tailwind, absolutely keep flying, keep the pressure on, keep it up. If it is a crosswind, you know, you're going to have to actively battle those crosswinds appropriately and not treat it like a tailwind. So when you see your pace dropping because of the cross, um, don't necessarily go over the top to keep your speed up there is a pro and a con uh, for everything and if your speed drops five ten miles an hour once you do hit those crosswinds and you're trying your best to keep it up at that 25 30 mile an hour area um, see what your power is see what that's doing to your heart rate okay i know there's only a couple of miles left but again most times that's a fool's errand here and people fall into a trap big time on that course here uh, and that is our bike. Another huge, huge thing for you to be aware of, um, and I'm going to zoom in really small for you, is this uh, one of the final left-hand turns right through there. It does sneak up on you very quickly. There's going to be arrows over here. There might be someone blocking traffic. There might not be. Uh, I've approached this area in both scenarios here. Uh, and if you aren't paying attention, you can miss this because you're, you usually have your head down and you're battling the wind, you're trying to get back. Um, and you, it's, this is easy to miss over here. Once you get back into these neighborhoods over here, there is another right-hand turn uh, and things kind of become, they go from being busier on the main road to all of a sudden, boom, nothing going on. Um, and that can be a little concerning for you out there, but just stick with the road out there. This cross section, crossing the road here, um, watch out, just be careful. Um, there could be some people crossing there. There's all kinds of stuff that happens on race day back through here. So in my mind, once you get to about this point on the race over here, your race is kind of done and you need to be shutting things down in the grand scheme of things. That is very, very late in our race course. All right. Very late. So it doesn't really necessarily matter a hundred percent. Uh, once you get past beyond this, you can still go fast, but just make sure you are brake ready uh, in this situation until you get back to where we started over here. Uh, once you cross over 445, then uh, you can kind of ease up on just being 100% brake ready there. And that's our bike, believe it or not. This is our power profile. Take the elevation away for you. And you can see here that for the first eight-ish miles, power is very, very steady. And it's going to be a little hard to see without me zooming out. Um, power is going to be very, very steady over here. And then it becomes a little bit choppier up through here, up through our, our circle over here. And that's where we get some more elevation mixed in. As you can see right through there, that explains the chops in power there. Um <clears throat> And then it becomes a little smoother for the remainder of the race. But you can see here, we do have some choppiness mixed in here as we slowly approach the finish line. It's not quite like the first uh, eight miles where it's very, very flat. Nothing from a elevation standpoint is really changing a whole lot. Uh, time analysis here. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is check out, let's see what happens if I go 5% harder. You're going to have a couple of areas that is going to yield some very, very positive results for you. Uh, I will say that this happens at a, a little bit more than mile 13 into the race. We still have 11 more miles to go. Just because you save four and a half, five seconds on this hill right here, uh, doesn't mean that you are going to be four and a half, five seconds faster. There is 11 ish miles left before the finish line and a lot can go wrong or right up until that point right there. So if you give those four or five seconds away later on, then going hard here was pointless. Uh, and that's another common, common trap on this race course. 
But nevertheless, going faster is going to get you about a minute faster, maybe a little bit more uh, on a course like this. And so for this athlete, this average power was at 171. Let's call it 172. Uh, the adjusted for 5% harder is 180. Uh, and again, that's going to save you around a minute-ish, maybe a little bit more on race day. All right. Uh, scrolling through here, that was our bike. Just be smart. Um, I know that they don't list aid stations. It's because there is none. On the on the run, this is our run loop. Uh, I have here, we'll get this into a more friendly viewing style for you. Uh, this is mapped out uh, just because uh, we have a whopping seven feet of elevation gain over here. The reason that this was in a satellite view was for you to see exactly what happens during this stretch of the road very few areas are shade covered uh you don't really have that luxury on this course aside from this section right through here and then we're back out into the sun and it's full sun on the way all the way on that long stretch back in before we start to get some shade over there but you'll notice that the shadows on this course they came very quickly they also left very quickly so the reason that wasn't a satellite view is because there's not a lot of shade on this course so if it is hot out there if the sun is blasting it's gonna feel really hot out here uh wind doesn't always blow on this race course and we will go back to the to this just to show you the smiley faces are the aid stations here so you are going to have six opportunities to get aid on this course uh and also this one might serve as a double dual sided aid station for you which means you could get even more aid out there <clears throat> because of that there's no excuse no 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 excuse um to fall apart out here what happened on the bike? Did you fuel properly? If not, start fixing it ASAP on the run. If you find that, you know, whoa, I'm not feeling so good, slow down. Slow down, fix your nutritional, hydrational, uh, liquid issues, uh, calorie issues, fix them. You actively need to go through your checklist, and that happens probably in the neighborhood on the bike or right before you make that last real left-hand turn on the race course on the bike. You need to be going through and saying, wow, I overdid it on the bike. I know I'm going to do this on the run. Don't get to mile two and a half on the run and say, oh, gosh, I need to fix this. It's too late by that point. You need to be starting to fix it the second you realize it on the bike, um, which happens way sooner. All right, but nevertheless, let's go through and show you how you're going to attack this. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, for the first couple of bits here, you're going to just be easing into the run for the whole first, let's call it two and a half miles where that dip is. And I'll show you where that is on the race map right through there where that section is. Uh, this whole section is going to be a not an easing into it. This is going to be our first um, race mode area here. Uh, that first little section where we just eased into it for that about quarter mile, uh, that was our ease in period. This is an Olympic, which means our break in time is very short and the pace is on pretty much right from the go. Okay. Once you get to this section over here, you're at race pace, you're going through your checklist, you're seeing what happens. If you get through the first quarter mile and you're saying, wow, I don't know if I can do this today, don't. Uh, <laughs> slow down a little bit. Take the time to fuel at those aid stations. Get yourself back to good before you start ramping up a little bit. If you are not feeling good, your effort level is going to look like this over the course of our race. If you are feeling good, your effort level is going to look like this. And you ramp up uh, to this section over here. This section right through here, this is going to be a reevaluation section. When we look at our aid stations, a critical one happens right here for our second loop. Critical, absolutely must hit. After that point, you have another uh, race paced block through here. Uh, if that first one felt good, go again for the second one. And not rocket science on a course like this, biggest limiting factor is going to be yourself and also the environment uh the course is really a non-factor out here um from like an elevation standpoint it's just the only main factor is you i know that there is not a um on this road uh rock hall ave uh there's not a like a huge elevation hit but you will likely have a steady downhill going 
down up to that final turn right through here. Final turn uh, mixed in over here uh, up to our finish line. This is a common area for athletes to just be blindsided that there's a finish. Uh, once you get to this corner, it's kind of go time. All right, that's that's it. On on the whole uh, elevation thing, on the elevation side of things over here, or uh, distance-wise, we're talking about 5.7 miles into the race here, right? So there's almost no time left. So that's where your final kick really starts. And what athletes typically do is they wait until they get to this second loop right here to say, oh, my goodness, I am done with the race. Start back here if you're feeling good, okay? Start back there. All right. That is our uh, 2024 Rock Hall in a nutshell. If you have any questions or want to know uh, some personal things about this race course and how to tack it for you specifically, uh, reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer any questions or things like that. Um, good luck, everybody, on 2024 edition of Rock Hall Olympic Triathlon.